Hey guys, Gaia Gaius here. I'm back once more with Gaia Gear Part 14, and it's time for the final arc to kick into high gear. For a brief recap of the last episode, Afarachi and his allies reached the Federation capital of Nouveau Paris. Believing they can stop Dargle's plans to seize control of the Earth Sphere, the heroes found no one left in the city after Dargle's coup was a success. However, they did find one survivor, that being Jack Bloom, who's been left behind by Dargle to give Afarachi a message. Everly has been taken. Dargle has left France and has traveled to Bavaria, Germany to begin the preparations for his new regime as the Earth Sphere's new sole ruler. Over with Yurian, he and Krishna have some intimate relations, and he's called out by Lila on the fact he's willingly allowing himself to underpower himself in the next fight so he can win Krishna's affections. With Afranchi and his friends having a moment to rest, we learn a little more about Kellen and his own history, one that throws Messer and Ray for a loop. As it turns out, he's had a very similar upbringing compared to them. Joe lashes out of the group as he blames himself for his failure to save Krishna, and with Yurian and Lila's strike team on their way, Afaranchi can sense Yurian's presence as the next battle begins, the Gaia Gear Alpha and the improved Brom Texter now ready for the next stage of their duel. Now, let's begin this action-packed episode and continue the story with episode 21, titled Battle's End. All images and characters are owned by the respective companies and creators. Afarachi is in the Gaia Gear. The engine is reaching the red line. He knows the feeling. Yurian is on his way. The Gaia Gear transforms on the ground, standing tall as it blasts off into the air. Afarachi can sense it, the presence, Pressure. Madra asks if Michael could see anything on their sensors, but nothing has appeared so far. Jack asks what Afaranchi's deal is, and Madra explains that he's a new type. Miranda then walks in, and she asks what's happening. Madra explains the current situation. Yurian is on his way. Joe has launched in his Dochati as well. Madra gives the red alert. It seems the enemy is closing in from all around them. All hands to battle stations. Kellen, Messer, and Ray get into their own man machines. It seems they're raring to go as well. It seems Yurian has come here to try and finish them off. Messer himself wants payback, and the two Dochatis and the Zoran Soul launch into the sky. The Air Force's heat sensors have detected them. Yurian's squadron, ten man machines closing in fast. The group is impressed, quite the number of troops for Yurian to muster. Afaranchi has been spot on in his assumption, and Jack is convinced now that Afaranchi is no doubt the heir to Shar. The Brom texters close in. Lila can see the Gaia gear on her scanners. She thought Yurian trashed the thing, though. Yurian says that it doesn't matter. He knows Afaranchi will come to face him, even if he's in a damaged piece of equipment. The squadron closes into the city, and Yurian can spot them approaching in the air. The group closes in, and the two squadrons begin to engage in air-to-air -air combat 8v10. Lila spots the Gaia gear. It was fixed? The unit fires around from its beam rifle. She dodges it and fires back. The Gaia gear glancing over at Lila's Brom texture as it evades her attacks at close range. Lila is frustrated. Not bad for a new type. Yurian orders they split up and the squadron launches in their separate directions all over the city below. As Avaranchi gives chase, he can sense Yurian's presence is weaker than before. He's not using the Saikamu? Kellen gives the alert that the Brom texture has landed in the streets. Joe says that he can flank him, and Avaranchi warns him not to get too close. Kellen says that they should get closer to the ground too. Up in the air, they could get picked off by someone. Avaranchi agrees, and he orders Kellen to take Messer and Ray with him as backup. As Avaranchi gives chase to Yurian, he still finds it odd. Why is he not using the Saikamu? He thought he wanted to finish this. He can't use his funnels in the city, it'd be too dangerous and too close to proximity for him. As the Gaia Gear lands, Avaranchi can see that Minovsky particles are getting too dense here. Yurian is close, but he can't tell on his scanners who's friend or foe. Avaranchi realizes that he has to be careful who he shoots at this point. He spots Yurian, and he fires a burst of beam energy the Brom Texter easily avoids. Avaranchi now gets it, he's using the buildings as a shield. Over with Yurian, he himself realizes that his Brom Texter is running slower than usual. It seems he now realizes what it's like to be forced not to use the Saikamu, but luckily, the city is cramped enough to forbid any extreme maneuvers, so he should be able to take him down with this amount of protection. Durian won't be beaten again this time. Meanwhile, on the bridge of the Air Force, Michael says that they've engaged in the city. Madra says that's bad, that if they're not careful, this fight could lead to a battle of attrition, which isn't good for their troops, since they have so few man machines left. Miranda says that Avaraji has got this, and Madra asks Jack to be prepared to evacuate the ship if necessary. Jack says he's fine with it, he's been content with going down with the ship for the past 60 years after all, that he'll gladly die with Metatron if things come to it. Captain thanks him for the confidence boost, and orders that the ship ready for anti-air combat, and to 
deploy the ships and barrier. Back with Messer and Ray, the group splits up. They thought they'd be fighting an air battle. Now this thing has gone to the ground, and it's gonna suck to pilot these things in such a cramped space. Ray then says that she read about urban combat in the suit's manual. Messer smirks at the thought of her reading a book, though, and Ray says that she had to do some last-minute cramming before they left. Messer asks how they're supposed to fight, and Ray says that it's simple. Hand to hand. Messer says he likes that idea. After all, he loves a good brawl. But as the two ready themselves, one of the Brom texters blasts out from behind one of the buildings, grabs hold of Ray's Dochati, and grinds it against one of the nearby buildings. At first, they both think it's Urian, but no, it's Lila. She laughs at the two. It seems Urian has become quite the celebrity with them. Messer struggles to try and get his beam saber drawn, but Lila is quick to whip out her own beam saber and skewer Ray's Dochati in the shoulder. Ray tries to use the Vulcans, but the rounds just keep bouncing off the Brom Texter's armor. Luckily, the damage was enough to cause her to let go, and the two Dochatis make a break for it behind another set of buildings. Lila curses Ray, and the two Dochatis try to figure out their next move. Ray says that the damage to her shoulder won't let her beam rifle be fired anymore. Messer asks her to go back to the ship. Ray says that she can still fight, though. She just has to switch weapons to the other arm. This causes the two to bicker whether or not to stay or not, but the two finally decide to stick together. They're gonna fight together to the end. Back with Kellen, he can't find where Joe went. The interference is too much, and he can't locate him at all. Afaranchi offers to go find him, and Kellen says that he can't rely on their comms. The only thing that's going to get them through this interference is the Gaiagir's Psychomu. Over with Joe, he still can't use his sensors either. He can only rely on the suit's camera feed. As the DH-3B marches through the streets, Joe keeps thinking about Yurian. He's gonna make him pay. As he wonders where he went, Yurian's Brom Texter blasts from behind and slashes the DH-3B in the back. Yurian then mockingly asks where Joe was looking and that he was easily able to sneak up on him from behind. Joe calls him out and demands to know where Krishna is. Yurian at first is taken aback, but then says that she's fine. She's actually working for him now. Joe is confused. Yurian says that Krishna has willingly joined him and is now his woman. Joe calls bullshit, and Yurian laughs. He then rushes towards the DH-3B, unleashing a storm of beam energy that pelts the scrawny man machine as it flies towards him, knocking out the main camera and causing the suit to lose its footing. Yurian then mockingly asks why he can't move, but before he can land any sort of fatal hit, Afaraji storms up to the two with the Gaia gear, firing a trio of shots to send Yurian reeling from Joe's damaged unit. The two fight through the streets, firing beam shots as they zip through the alleys. Two ignite their beam sabers, and they immediately clash with one another. Avaraji demands to know what Yurian did with Krishna. Yurian says that she's never coming back, that she slept with him, and now she's his. Avaraji tells him to shut up, leaving Joe to rush in on foot with his own machine, causing Yurian to draw his beam rifle, firing it with the other hand while the saber is locked to Avaraji's. The burst pelts the DH-3B in the arms as Joe tries to shield himself, knocking his machine over as the bullets sent him reeling into the city rubble. As Yurian continues to tangle with Avarachi, Lila comes over from the other side and asks Yurian to back off. She has a clear shot at Avarachi's cockpit, but instead, Yurian asks her to finish off the DH-3B that's laying on the ground. Lila complies, but as she takes aim, Afaraji leaps in to shield Joe from the blast. He's not letting him die. With that, Afaraji finally activates the Gaia Gear's new funnels. Yurian is stunned. He screams out to Lila to back off, but it's too late. Afaraji gives his funnels the order. The Gaia Gear's new funnels zip around the red Brom texture, piercing the suit like drills, punching holes in the unit as they zip around its body and blasting the suit to pieces, blowing the suit's reactor and causing a shockwave that takes out a whole blocks worth of the city ruins. Yurian is frozen. Lila. She's dead. His rage grows. He blindly calls out to Krishna. He's sorry. He's going to be breaking his promise to her. He has no other options. He has to take him down with the Saikamu and nothing else. He turns it on to maximum power. Avaraji can start to sense it. That sensation. He can feel the sensation rising as he feels Yurian's anger emanate from the machine like a storm cloud. Yurian orders his funnels to attack, and Avarachi immediately commands his own as well, the funnel beams whizzing around like a giant swarm of finely pointed needles, the two suits expertly evading their attacks as the two clash in a sheer battle of willpower. As the two fight, Kellen and the two punks come to aid them. With Avarachi struggling to hold Yurian's funnels back, he orders them to go get Joe. They need to get him out of here. Kellen complies, and the group grabs the busted DH-3B as the group makes a break for it. As the two fight, Avaraji asks once again, 
What did he do with Krishna? Yurian says that he did what he knew was right. He gave her his love. Love that she was starved of since she was a child. He asks him if she even told him that. And what did he do for her? Try to satisfy her heart? No. Avaranchi says that she's one of them. That she's a part of them. Because she, like them, wants to save the Earth. But Yurian says that that's just the high and mighty spouting nonsense. That because he preaches that, he's closed off his true heart to others. Back with Joe, he can hear it all. All of it. What Yurian is saying, he can't help be frozen. He hears Yurian say it. She belongs to him now. Joe doesn't believe it, though. And in a fit of blind fury, heedless of his friends telling him to stop, Joe gets the DH-3B off the ground on its own and races it towards Yurian's Brom texter. Yurian can see him coming. He thought the thing was downed. He readies the funnels to hit him again, and Afarachi tells Joe to stop. Get away! Kellen calls out to him too, but before the funnels have a chance to land their beams, Kellen races towards Joe, shoving the DH-3B with his man machine, the beams skewering the Zoran soul from every angle, destroying the cockpit, and killing Kellen instantly in the blast. The group is frozen. Kellen! No! Yurian laughs. Now it's Afarachi's turn. Afarachi curses Yurian, and the two activate their funnels again, the swarm of beams erupting once more. But this time, the power of them is so great, the funnels end up destroying each other in a blaze of beaming energy. As the smoke clears, Yurian wonders where he went, but Avaraji bursts towards him at top speed, forcing the Brom texter back and pushing it through several buildings, crashing through them one by one, smashing it to the ground. As Yurian lies on the ground, he now realizes he's beaten, but he's not going to die here. He blasts off into the sky, retreating as his plans for his final battle are ruined. It seems Avaraji and his forces have won, but at a great cost. The episode ends with Avaraji reeling from the victory, but only to turn to the sound of Joe, saying over and over again that it's all his fault. Kellen's dead. It's all because of him. Episode 21. This episode was big. The battle was nuts to hear, and we're now beginning to see the dominoes begin to fall. Avaraji has killed Lila, and Yurian has killed Kellen. As for Lila, it does suck that she's gone, but we all knew she was also gonna buy it soon with that cocky attitude of hers. But geez, let's give a moment to just praise the bestest bro in the whole story. Rest in peace, Kellen. Didn't deserve it. But now it seems we're drawing closer to the end now. And once again, like I said, dominoes are beginning to fall. Lila and Kellen's deaths are an obvious sign of that. Avarashi and Yurian just destroyed each other's funnels instantly with the sheer power of the two as they fought. It's also unfortunate that Yurian broke his promise, and this is a sign that Yurian is starting to become more and more focused on the rivalry than that of Krishna, something that will be a deciding factor in the final battle that is yet to come. As for Avarachi, you can tell that he's also kind of getting swallowed up by it. Luckily, he's been able to show a little more restraint, but using the Saikamu as well is not a good sign for him either. You can tell from the audio that it's taking a lot out of him. Not as much as Yurian, but still enough. Only time will tell, but now we're going to be bringing this episode to an end. Tune in next time where I go in and cover episode 22 with the surprise return of another character, one we haven't seen in a while. Anyways, that'll be it. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Turn on the notification bell to make sure you're caught up with the story. And this is Guy Gaius, signing off.